كل شيء هلو اهلا السلام عليكم ماسكا جرو احنا النهارده هنبتدي سيشن جديده وكلام جديد ضمن ضمن المهرجان بتاعنا والاحتفاليه بتاعتنا نوبيا فاست اسبوع طويل كله كلام عن النوبه والنهارده نعتذر لكل الناس اللي كانت بتتفرج من شويه لما السيشن بتاعتي كانت بالعربي والاول مره بالنوبين احنا في منتهى السعاده انه انه نوبيا فاست كان في سيشن بالنوبين والنهارده هنتكلم عن مشكله مشكله او اشكاليه بتواجهنا احنا وثقافات كتير مقهوره زينا واللي هي مشكله الاستيلاء الحضاري هتعذرونا بس دلوقتي علشان السيشن دي هتبقى بالانجليزي احنا اسفين هنرجع بحاجات تانية كتير بالعربي بس دلوقتي هنتكلم عن الاشكاليه دي والاستيلاء الحضاري بتترجم او ترجمه مقربه للي بنقول عليه بالانجليزي cultural appropriation ديما شكرا ماسكا جرو ويلكم ويلكم فريندز فاميلي لوفرز اوف نوبيا انديجينس فاميلي فروم اراوند ذا وورلد وير ايفر يو ار تيونينج ان فروم بليز تيك ا مومنت تيل اس ان ذا كومنتس وير يو ار تيونينج ان فروم تيك ا مومنت شير ذس فيديو Thank you, Minna, for your introduction. Um, we are navigating new ways, new platforms, and ways we can try and please as many people as we can, um, where we are holding this space for our family, for our communities, also bearing in mind that not all of us speak our indigenous languages, not all of us are able to communicate in these languages and we are working with what we have um, for the preservation, for the protection of our culture, heritage, wherever we are from and wherever we currently are. And I'm so happy and blessed and honored to be in this space, which is held uh, under the umbrella of the Kendaka official. And I'm hoping we'll get to speak about that a bit more, but in that this space is not only about Nubian heritage, it is about indigenous heritage, indigenous cultures around the world and how we connect to one another and how this connection is under constant attack, is under constant deliberate attack and the efforts we are seeing to appropriate this culture and to counter these efforts of appropriating this culture. So I'm going to ask the fam on the screen here, um, and I'll just go with what I'm seeing on my screen. So this has the, the no preferences here. I'm just gonna go with the order that I'm seeing on my screen. And I um, will ask for a quick introduction for each from each of you. And then we'll get started with a question. And I'll go with Rami. Also maybe so we, we don't have him feeling like he's, I don't know, he's outnumbered here by the women and I take a moment and a shout out to the indigenous women and a shout out to the black women. You are rising, we see you. If you are in doubt, just look at the screen as we wave. Rami, all yours. Mascagro, mascagro, oh no, Vanutu. My name is Rami Dawood. I am um, a musician, actor, and uh, I have Start in in a week's time, I can start calling myself a writer because my book will have been published. So I'm excited about that, and uh, I'm just excited and I'm honored to be in the presence of these Kandakat here, these these queens, and uh, just to be a part of this conversation with them. It means a lot to me, so I'm looking forward to this. Thank you, Rami. Hola. Hello, um, my name is um, Ula Labib. Um, I am, oh God, what can I say? I am a pharmacist, I'm a stand up comedian, and I think I can also call myself a writer now because um, my scripts uh, now been commissioned to be developed. So I'm going to take the writer title as well. Um, it is an absolute blessing to be here. I just want to thank Dima, like, mashallah, like putting all this together is absolutely amazing to go from um, starting off with a group of people to literally 
all over social media, people from different backgrounds, different countries, different genders, different ages, finally asking the question, oh, is Nubia a real place? To, 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 to go from not hearing that to people actually showing interest, um, you know, they just think that this whole idea of a Nubian queen is just, where does it come from? To have people finally asking, oh, is it actually a place? And being able to tell people that, yeah, it's real. It's a beautiful thing. So um, even though one step is one step in the right direction, you've opened up the eyes of many people, which is amazing. Thank you. I only continue the work, the great work and the legacy of our ancestors uh, with what God allows me to. Thank you for that. It's very humbling to hear it um, and feel it. And on the question of being questioned of, is this real? Aisa, what is real? <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> Hi, my name is Aisa Youssef. Um, I am a indigenous from Turtle Island and Black American. And I am a blogger, jewelry maker, um, activist, um, lover of the earth, um, ceremonialist, um, many, many different things. <laughs> Um, and I'm really fortunate and glad to be here. Thank you for being here. She's also a mermaid. That's a secret secret, but it's out now. Um, and she's all kinds of magical. And I'm very, very grateful that you are here, my sister. Minna. Okay, I'm the more boring one here. Hi, I am Minna Ara. I am an architect, a researcher, and assistant professor of design and spatial justice at the University of Carleton. And now I feel so boring with all these amazing bios and exciting things. And I'm like, I'm an academic, ha ha. But it's, uh, I am a third generation displaced Fadika Nubian woman. And that's not, that's exciting then. The displaced part is not exciting, but being a Nubian woman is. <laughs> well, donut that got that got donut worked up. Uh, the displaced part. Donut is my little sister's um, dog, who is around and present for this conversation. And speaking of sisters, I am happy and privileged to yield, ooh, just as I am prepared to yield to my older sister, the tech gremlins go in full mode and we have lost her. So we ask for your prayers to come through for the internet connection to get um, stronger. Here we are, yay. So I will not really be doing any, come on Delia, let's go. Come on, there we go, my older sister, my friend, my mentor, um, Dalia Mahmoud, co-founder of the Nubia Initiative. Uh, please introduce yourself. Thank you for tuning in. Hello. Hi, my name is Dalia. I'm uh, sorry for the internet. It keeps logging me off and on. Um, I don't know if it's a bandwidth problem. Um, Minna, you're not the only boring academic around, although I don't think being an academic is boring. Um, I think we change the world every day. So <laughs> yay to academics. Um, I'm a designer, uh, artist, creative um, person, um, and I'm an educator. I'm very proud to be a build programs um, and build minds. And that's all I have to say for now. Uh, I'm Dima's sister. So that's also a really nice title that I'm very proud of. I'm currently based in Dubai and I've been working on the cultural and creative industry here um, and building this bridge all through MENA, um, hopefully to see a lot of, um, a lot of change. That's it. Ashe. Um, Ola, I don't know if you were actually shooing something that was flying or when she said Dubai, you were channeling me and doing that. 
But I'm gonna go. No, I was, I was, I was showing all the love in the air between you two. That's what I was doing. Oh, hey there. I see. You're the one messing with the internet. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, our conversation today is indigenous heritage and all the different ways that's under attack. Indigenous culture, indigenous knowledge, um, and how each of you here are bringing it to life bringing your heritage to life, uh, emphasizing the continuity, uh, protecting it, but also all the people you know. Because as much as we feel like, oh, you know, Ola's great introduction, very, very generous um, words. I'm not doing this alone. None of us is. So this conversation is about what we're seeing in terms of efforts to preserve, protect, promote our indigenous heritage, where we're from, where we are, and against those who say it doesn't exist or it never existed. So I'd like to start the conversation by asking, what does culture appropriation mean to you? What are examples of culture appropriation for you um, from your respective fields or in general? And I'm just going to open the conversation, and this is going to be an open dialogue. Fam, tuning in from wherever you're tuning in in the world, tell us where you're tuning in from, take a moment, share this, and engage with us in the comments as well. What does cultural appropriation mean to you? What is an example of cultural appropriation? Oh, go on, Bob, you want me to first? Okay. Um, for me, cultural appropriation would mean um, when someone partakes in a culture, but benefits from it, while those people who have never stopped living the reality of that culture are oppressed because of who they are. You know, when you when you are in an industry such as mine, if you are an art, a musician, a rapper, and um, you know you you claim Nubia, which is fine to a certain extent, I don't have an issue with that. But you don't take the time to listen to those of us who have always been Nubian and never stopped being Nubian. I don't have the, um, the luxury of going home and, and, stop, and to stop being Nubian. That is not an option for me. Nubia is in my blood. I was born, my parents are Hanfawiyin. I have family from Balana of people from, you know what I mean? And, and, and so we transcend borders. We are people who have been there since the beginning of time. And that is in our blood, it's in our speech, it's in our everyday practices, the way we live our lives. And so if someone is inspired by this culture or by this identity, that's an honor for me, but have the respect to ask me about it, have the respect of learning from, 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 from those who continue to live it. It is, not, it is not a mask you can put on and take off when, when it puts a few hundred dollars in your bank account. You know what I mean? It's, not, it's more than a slogan. It's more than a brand. This is the reality that we live. And so that, that to me is um, the definition of culture appropriation, like on the surface level. I can get deeper into it, but for the sake of this conversation, we'll keep it going. So, yeah. So, I have been, first of all, let me, let me bring forward the point on indigenous people and indigeneity to the forefront as a person who just moved to Canada there's an indigenous Nubian woman being told here that indigenous only means North American, indigenous. So even when we find a global project, a glo global political project, they redline it for us. They tell us who we are, no, not us telling them who, who we are. So I would like to just reiterate and say here that indigenous is a global political project. Your your indigenous you can be indigenous from Africa, you can be indigenous from North, Amer North America, you can be indigenous um, from, um, uh, let's not call it North America, from Turtle Island, you're right, uh, Aisa. You can be indigenous from Europe. There are in, 
indigenous people in Italy and in, in Sweden and in Scandinavia. Indigeneity is a global pr political project that takes up the issue of land against um, projects of neoliberalization, capitalization that comes from racial capitalism, you know, as Cedric Robinson says, there is no such a thing as non-racial capitalism. All capitalism is, is racial capitalism. Then that takes us to the point of um, appropriation, uh, uh, cultural appropriation. I have been having this fight for so long and I would like Dima to just bring forward some things that are just, they're just on my chest. I'll just say them out loud. To my brothers and sisters, white especially, what is the difference between cultural appropri appropriation and cultural uh, appreciation? Here are some questions to ask yourself. If you buy a cultural artifact or enjoy a cultural product uh, or enjoy a cultural um, uh, product or, or something that is produced within a certain culture, ask yourself, are the people who are, have produced this or have done this are fairly and, and well um, compensated, not just by your money giving for this service, but in general. So the whole system of commercializing this or of, of exchanging this is fair. If not, it's partly cultural appropriation. So another question, ask yourself, if you buy an artifact or something that looks you exotic and sexy and you wear it, ask yourself, do you understand the meanings of these shapes? Do you understand where it's rooted, what it, what it means, what it signifies, and what it stands for politically and morally? If not, that's also cultural appropriation. Last one, and, and I'm going to shut up because this is really, this has been really irking me for a long time. Another one. If you are engaging with a certain culture and the people of said culture ask you politely or not, to stop extracting from them or stop um, pretending or stop taking up the space because they need to breathe and talk. But you feel like you're entitled to speak in the name of somebody else for uh, of a lineage that's not yours or of a, of a culture that's not yours. That's certainly cultural appropriation and other things to, add, to be added to that. I have a bunch of things on mind. I'll shut up now. I'll let it go. But I wanted to just start by this. What, what, how do you detect cultural appropriation when you do it? Just as a coming out of the bat. I think there's, um, I think uh, Minna made an amazing point, and so did the Rami, of course. And uh, I was going to say something, then I've lost my trail of thought. Um, but there's obvious cultural appropriation and there's cultural appropriation that people are actually oblivious to it. So popular thought, cultural appropriation, for example, um, when you see like white people with dreadlocks, you know, people scream cultural appropriation when they see that all the time. And it's because they'll do it, but they don't actually know the meaning behind it. So this is what people call like evident cultural appropriation. The other one that I think really relates to what we're talking about today is when this whole concept of Nubian queen, where you get every Tom, Dick and Harry talking about how they're Nubian queens, they're Nubian queens, they're Nubian queens. A lot, I don't wanna say a lot, but a number of these people claiming that they're Nubian queens wouldn't even know, don't even know what Nubia is. So. It's one thing not knowing what struggles that, you know, like what um, Nubian people have gone through, but to not even know what Nubia is. So I do comedy and there was a uh, there's a Jamaican comedian and she was like, mm hmm, because I'm just a Nubian queen. So I was like, oh, are you from are you from Nubian? Are you Nubian? And she was like, what? And I was like, oh, you said you're a Nubian kid. I was just curious. Um, what's your um, ethnic background? And she was like, I'm Jamaican. I was like, oh, of Nubian heritage. She was like, oh, there's no such thing as Nubia. It's just like, it's just a thing for all black women. So the fact that you're calling yourself that, but you're actually completely oblivious to what even Nubian is, is that ignorant culture appropriation? My question is, how would you even begin 
explaining because it's, it's not just one person I watch Housewives of Atlanta and I see like a lot of the um, women on there are always referring to themselves as Nubian queens. Would you classify that as cultural appropriation is my question to you. Bam. I see Aisha. Ooh, hola. Um, let me mute. Let me mute. Let me mute. I, I see Aisha nodding and I do want to yield her, but I want to acknowledge our brother, Nasser Abdel Hamid. Um, who is joining and asking why in English? Ya Nasir, Bashkura Kasuel, Hayah Nandina Fakarat Muhtalifa, Fakarat Bilogat Muhtalifa, Leino Eturath in Nubi, Adda in Borders, and Hakalim and Nafsi. أنا العربي ما بتكلموش كويس مش لغتي واللغة النوبية اتسرقت مني ما بعرفهاش ولسه بتعلم اللغة اللي أنا عارفة أتكلم بيها هي اللغة الإنجليزية فبنحاول على قد ما نقدر إنه نعمل برامج بالعربي وبالإنجليزي والنهاردة كمان كان في أول فقرة لنا كمان بالنوبين وبشكر الدكتورة منا على على مداخلتها وإنه والأخ إسلام للترجمة بالنوبي الفقرة دي هتكون اللايف هيكون بالإنجليزي عشان معانا حضارات تانية حضارات الشعوب الأصيلة اللي في ما يسمى النهاردة الولايات المتحدة وما بيتكلموش اللغة العربية لكن في تواصل بين الحضارات يعني النوبيين جم هنا أنا دلوقتي بتكلم من ما يسمى الولايات المتحدة فعايزين نتواصل في في الحضارات دي ونعرف احنا ازاي مهمشين مهما كنا وين ما كنا كشعوب اصيله اصليه اصليه رايت right? اتس اصليه شعوب اصليه بس هنلاقي ترجمه وهنحط السب تايتلز فهنعيد عرض الـ الـ الفيديو ده مع الترجمه العربي هتتحط تحت في الفيديو فبشكرك على السؤال وبنعتذر إنه مش كل الفقرات هتنفع تكون بالعربي لأنه إحنا بنحاول نوصل كل الحضارات ببعض على قد ما نقدر ونبين إنه فعلا النوبة موجودة في كل حد شكرا أحب أتمنى أن ده يكون رد على السؤال Sorry for that Aisa we, we, we need to emphasize sometimes that as much as we would love for our communication to be in a language that is understood by our family everywhere, um, it's simply not accessible. And also if we are looking to connect all these cultures and heritages um, for which we carry and come from, we need to be in a language that is um, sort of accessible to all of us. And as unfortunate as it is, that is the English language at the moment, <laughs> just yet. You are an intersection of many indigenous heritages. And I see you shaking your head when Ola was asking what she was asking. So please. Um, well, I just want to say that, yes, while cultural appropriation most times does stem from white people being ignorant to other cultures, um, cultural appropriation isn't always just white people. There are people of color throughout the world who can also culture appropriate other people's culture as well. So to Ola's um, point, there can be like black people. A good example for me coming from the States is football. Football is something that happens in the fall and it's a big like ritual for all people around the country. And there are many different sports teams that have um, Native American mascots as their mascots, like chief's heads or um, the like med medicine headdresses that people wear. And what irks me and my mom a lot is there's this black man who lives in DC and he goes around during um, sports season during the, what used to be called the Redskins, but now is the Washington football franchise until they find a new name. Um, but he would go around as a black man and wear a Native American headdress during football season and wear their jersey. And whenever we would have any of our um, like 4th of July parades or whatever, they would come and he would come with his big headdress on. And I was like, as a black person and as an indigenous person, this feels like really off-putting because like 
I'm indigenous, so this is like inappropriate because you're not indigenous, so you don't know what the significance is of a headdress, right? But you're also a black person, so you should know better, like, because your culture is appropriated like all the time, every day. Afros are appropriated, and just being black in general is appropriated all the time through everything. So you should be more culturally sensitive to the fact that there are other cultures out there who can be culturally appropriated and like know that, okay, I'm a culturally appropriated, so I shouldn't culturally appropriate other people's culture as well. And I should learn more about those cultures instead of just being ignorant and being like, you know, I'm an American, so let me be ignorant and like not learn about other people's culture. Let me actually learn and like know what I'm actually representing when I do certain things. Well, that and and the excessive saging as well from the the, the communities here, um, you know, all and the time. And it's not something I I know much about. I'm still learning, but it's something that I see used over and over and over again. Like I know as a Nubian, there are certain things that we use for cleansing a space or for protection or for that. And it's not sage, but my culture, from my heritage, it's not sage. But I will see, you know, Nubian people here um, on Turtle Island saying, oh, you know, let's bring out the sage. And I was like, okay, why? Why? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like yeah. learn your own ways of using your medicine from wherever you come from that you use to cleanse or do ceremony. Learn what those are so that you can use those and then, because sage is now an endangered species on Turtle Island, um, it's not something that is in abundance anymore. And it's something that tribes up north would use a lot and they would pick it and through ceremony and through prayer. And now it's just a commodity that everybody uses and it's new age fad and everybody just uses it for everything. And they sell it and they sell it for outrageous prices and the money does not go to indigenous tribes. And so it's like, I know these other cultures have ways of using medicine for ceremony. You just have to find out what they are and use those things. And if you are going to use sage, make sure it's gifted from an indigenous tribe and you know that it was done through ceremony and it isn't something that's being bought from like a new age shop from like white people who are not giving any money back to indigenous tribes. Where where do we um, or how much leeway should we give? Because I mean, I grew up I grew up in the states. I'm from Kansas City, so when you talk about the Chiefs and all that, like I'm a big Chiefs fan because I love the sport. But it's like I'm not a fan of the team name. You know what I mean? And I'm not a, I'm not a fan of that aspect of it. But um, with Black Americans specifically, you know, these are people that were flipped upside down and inside out throughout the years. And there are people who are looking for um, an identity in a way, right? Although this is not to take away from black, black culture is a culture and it is probably the most copied culture in the world. When we look at slang and the way people dress and, and what in every aspect of popular culture. But when I see a black American specifically claim to be Nubian and this and that, yes, it upsets me because I want to teach him about where I come from and who I am and my history. But at the same time, there's a soft spot in my heart because like I'm understanding of what they have gone through and what their ancestors have gone through. Um, so is, 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 is ignorant? Like where do we draw the line? Because we do live in the age of information. You know what I mean? Like the answers are right there on, 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 on your phone. But at the same time, like, where, where do we draw the line? The thing, I think the difference is if, you know, someone, you know, says, oh, Nubian queen or yeah, we're Nubians, whatever, when they're not, and you inform them and they're willing to take something back from it, then fine. But if you say, oh, by the way, you do know Nubians are X, Y, Z, and they're like, oh, in denial, then that's when it becomes unacceptable. So um, you talk about the sage. It, okay, if someone was saging, like I know that the Irish, I, I don't know what the relationship is, but 
staging in Irish culture is, is it's, it's like a thing and people know about it and they've been doing it for you know it's like a it's like a thing that's known here that the Irish stage as well um anyways if you were then to say to someone who says oh I'm staging or whatever and then you tell them but by the way you do know that this is something that our ancestors did and this and that and this and that and they accept it and they acknowledge it that's one thing but then if someone turns around and says well everyone's doing it now it's not just yours do you see what I mean things have been done because people have culturally appropriated for so long that in a hundred years from now someone can turn around and say well we've been doing this for years and years and years and years what makes it yours now so when Rami says when do you draw a line at what at what point do you it's, it's, it's almost a matter of what battles do you pick with certain people do you know what I mean um I actually see a lot of merit in Rami's point and I am never bothered by um, any African American brother or sister um, saying that the word Nubian. I am always um, I'm always disheartened by the fact that they don't know that Nubia is a real place, um, because the word Nubia to them, or just the entirety of the African continent, is an abstract space. They don't. It's it's just the notions that they. They, they were clinging to for somewhere that is otherwise. So I am never bothered by that. And when they say uh, no, things like Nubian queen, um, I don't feel like they're taking away from me because uh, Nubian monarchies are abolished. We don't really, I am not really a Nubian queen. I am, however, bothered by a Sudanese woman saying that she's Kendaka. Because the Kindeka is a Nubian word. And it means something in Nubian. And as a person in this zone of the world, and you have your land and you have your, your culture, trying to grab from minorities is something completely different while you stand in power. So I think that uh, what I was saying, you pick your battles, and I think also you, you kind of weigh the power dynamics. Um, while I in, I'm i also interested in Aisha's point in thinking about how well, black people then are complicit in the colonization of, uh, become complicit in the colonization of, uh, of indigenous and native people as well. And, and this has been happening. So even in our cult displacement, Nubian men were complicit in the, in the displacement of Nubian women out of their powers in, in their own episteme. So to me, the um, dynamics of complicity exist and I think we should dismantle them, uh, but we also should um, kind of uh, separate them from the fact that when an African-American woman says she's Nubian, she doesn't mean the same Nubian I, I have, which in itself is disheartening. I would like everybody in the world to know how beautiful my land was and how, how ancient and, and majestic in, in paradise like uh, but on the other hand, hand I understand that Nubia to her is a is a, a a metaphorical thing to hang to maybe that's what I'm trying to say and one maybe one more thing because I do agree with Iman uh, I do agree with Iman when she says appropriation is not a bad thing. I think we know all when we say uh, cultural appropriation what it means, but I would not even call it misappropriation. I would say cultural extraction. Just name it like uh, a spade a spade. I think it's extra. It's cultural extraction. I think there's cultural appreciation, like cultural appreciation and cultural appropriations, are are are, are two different things. You can, like, you know, when you go to Indian weddings, you know, here, th they would put on the sari. That's not appropriating the culture. That's, they're going to an Indian wedding. They want to show that, you know, they, they see it as beautiful, that they're celebrating it. But I think you make a really good point about um, Sudanese women calling themselves Kandaka and how that can really, really bother you. Like, even me, my 
family are literally Raminos are from here, there and everywhere. They're literally from all over Sudan. They don't even know where, um, like eventually they come from Adam, but in some form or roots or way. But like, I wouldn't, I couldn't call myself until doing reading, to be honest, until like following Rami, I didn't really know much about Nubia or like our roots or anything like that. Um, I have a really good friend of mine who lives in a Jazeera and you know I was talking about like Nubians and the tribes and this and that and she was like oh I don't know where I'm from I'll ask my dad and her dad was like oh I think I think we're Mahasin so they don't even know so for someone like that to then start calling themselves Kendaka when they um um Asia um Kendaka is like is a is the Nubian um the Nubian word for queen and well, you said no, you did my video like official. Oh, okay, well, there you go. And so, what was happening that sorry, we've got little gnat flies and they're like flying into my eyes as I'm talking. Um, so when the revolution happened, all of a sudden, well, like I don't even know where they even found the word. All of a sudden, all these girls are starting to say Kendaka, 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 and so it went from zero to a hundred really, really quickly. But these same people that are using this word literally never acknowledged what Nubia is, that it even existed, the displacement. They didn't know any of this, yet they were using that word. So it got a lot of people's backs up. So, Minda, my question to you is, I know how bugging it is for people to start using Kandaka, Kandaka, Kandaka. What if those same people weren't using Kandaka, but they were like, yeah, we're Nubian queens, we're Nubian queens. Do you think it would have bothered you? Do you think it would have bothered you as much? Yes, and because of the following. Uh, Nubian identity and its construction is really fluid. So we have all these categories of Nubians by lineage and Nubians by love. And, you, and, and if you're a Sudanese, in my opinion, you have Nubian lineage. It's just how you got or eradicated uh, out of that uh, kind of. So if you reclaim that, is something, but if a word that means so much to me becomes this uh, branding, a new liberal logo that people are using and and embellishing, it really it be, it really becomes a logo. It it becomes uh, disassociated from its original meaning, which is being a queen of mother. So the mothering in it, the the position of woman in it, you know, understanding what is the package that comes with the word. And the branding, the use of the word in the term in branding is my issue, not as a brand. Ah, Kindaka. So do you really claim this as a Nubian woman by love or by lineage? Or or is it what we are seeing now at Kindaka Cosmetics? I'm so glad that you are the one that brought that up because um, I can see someone in the comments saying, sorry, it was not all of a sudden. It was used throughout 30 years by Nubian and Sudanese Nubians to revolt. Yeah, so that's exactly what I said. So Nubians knew what that word was, but your typical Bumshi Ozone people literally had no clue what that was until the revolution happened. Let's be honest. People who went to Solidaire definitely didn't know what the word Kandaka meant. This all came out afterwards. So if you were using that word even previously to 30 years ago, but you know where it came from, you know the meaning behind it, you know the power behind it, and you appreciate the people that you appreciate like um, its roots, then okay, fine. But you had people like using Kandaka this, Kandaka that, Kandaka this, and it was like, you have no idea where it came from. So you need to understand you know, you you need to understand the struggle and where it came from in order to use it. But I mean, I think that that's a really important point that I think a lot of people, especially from my kind of background, like, you know, it's, find difficult to explain that, yes, once upon a time, we, we, are, we all stem from Nubians, but there was so much like mixing so much this and that. So at what point do you think that I want to focus. I want to focus here for a moment, if I can, if I if I can, because I see this going into a direction that's um, too much of a déjà vu, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm we're not necessarily here for that. Mm -hmm. And Dakagate has gone on for quite some time now, and 
this is in the platform for it. There are spaces we can have this conversation. We have extended invitations to have this conversation. We can hold open space to have this conversation with Nubians, Sudanese, Egyptians, Kenyans, Ugandans, Ethiopians, Eritreans, wherever Kenyans, uh, whatever Nubians are, continental or diasporan, this space isn't, it, this isn't what this conversation is about. And I don't hear anyone here saying who can or cannot use it. We are sharing personal experience. We are sharing where we come from, what appropriation means to us personally. And that I don't think anyone can, um, should, must dictate. Um, may, may I say something? I just uh, uh, checked into the chat and Mayeda uh, Kindaka Manan says, uh, that's fine, educate, but don't dedicate. Oh, there are a bunch of, uh, of comments. Thank you very much, Mayeda, for tuning in. Uh, this is exactly what you're, we are doing, and I see that you're using the word Kandeka in there. I hope you're claiming the paradigm, not just the word, and claiming the motherly um, position that comes with, the, with this word and the, the divine Nubian position. I would think um, educate is the right word here. It, it, for us, and Nubian women, growing up, when, when somebody calls me Kendaka, I just feel the responsibility. Like the, when Dima is like, so it says, welcome Kendaka, I'm like, oh my God, now I have to be, I take the, of that responsibility. We so are invoking I, that. We are in, and yeah, I so I see you claim that. And it's so, it's a, such a serious responsibility for us because Nubian women have been sustaining their communities through hell on high water. And I really uh, appreciate you uh, um, joining our discussion. Uh, I will reiterate that Mayada has her page um, Kandaka, uh, the Nubian Kandaka, I believe it is. Mayada, if you can, please drop that page in, in, the, in the comments. Um, she is an educator and a daughter of an educator uh, of, uh, on Nubian heritage and culture. And yes, it is about opening that space for, um, for education. It's, again, not... Can I? It, is, it is part of the legal name, and 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 she is Nubian and much older than. And again, it's it's not again. This is what I mean about having holding the space for communication and being able to engage without. And Donut agrees that I think he's feeling the energy that is <laughs> taking space here. Yeah. Can I, like, can I just say something real quick? Um, I think it's much more than it, it, It's more than about words. It's much deeper than than words. It's about respecting the people who have suffered because of these words. Even when it comes to Nubians, not all Nubians have suffered the same. Not all Nubians had their land uh, drowned and were kicked off of their land. You know what I mean? So even amongst the Nubian population, um, there are people who are ignorant to that. There are people, there are Nubians who don't know about Asad al-Ali. There are people who don't know that thousands of families were forced to relocate from their homeland, I don't know how many hundreds kilometers away. And within that process, we lost our identity pretty much. It's the reason why I, I'm not fluent in Nubian because I didn't grow up in my, I don't have a homeland to go to anymore. I don't have a village that I can go to, but um, I don't think we should dictate anything. I 100% agree with that because if if we pushed everybody to the side, if that was the way everything was going, then you know Malcolm X would have remained Malcolm Little, and we would have never got the person, the educator, and the man that we respect now, decades after his passing. Um, another thing, someone like me, right, who's I'm very proud of my culture and my heritage, but I grew up in the states, and I'm a rapper. Am I appropriating black culture? by rapping. So I don't I, I don't think I am because I'm not claiming this culture from like I'm not saying this is I'm I'm not taking that from black Americans. I respect them. I know this is something that they invented. This is theirs and I grew up and found this around me. So it's much more than just words and actions. It's about is the respect there. Are you willing to go and sit in these circles of these people who 
live the reality of these words and learn from them before taking on these words and and and, and just benefiting from them as if they were just a mere slogan or um, a social media hashtag. It's much more than that. It's about sitting down and learning about taking the time. And and so um, we should welcome people with open arms 100% only if they're willing to show the respect first and foremost. I, <laughs> Ola, you and your nuts and your bra, 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 what you call it, shelling, yeah? Shelling, shelling, shelling. All right. Um, I think we can, I'm happy to, uh, table that and continue the conversation. Again, this specific conversation isn't just about Nubian heritage. It's about indigenous culture, wherever it is. It is about taking the indigenous and taking the culture. I think right now I work, um, I am a very proud and blessed member of a growing culture, which is a collective of activists working with, for, um, alongside, indigenous communities, peasant groups, fisher folk um, for food sovereignty. The biggest issue there is the deliberate attempts to take culture out of agriculture, to take away our indigenous practice in the name of so-called development. A lot of that has to do with this system that is specifically designed uh, to oppress us, to keep us isolated from one another, to um, have us doubt one another, have us pick on certain things. Again, we've internalized the systems in so many ways we may not even recognize um, to what extent. And we tend to, and we sometimes do just project that on one another. What does development mean for someone of indigenous heritage? How are you viewing what development is is being paraded as on mainstream media, you know, on on platforms? But oh my God, Minna, your face says it all <laughs> when, when we're talking about development and sustainable development goals and all these seventeen goals. Like to me personally, I'll say they old medicine, new bottles. This is how our families, how our ancestors have lived. This is how they sustain this heritage. This is how we've continued. It's the, what needs to be confronted here is unjust power and how that has taken these practices and now slapped some labels on them. And all of a sudden, their fancy sustainable development goals paraded by the UN. What does development mean for indigenous culture, for indigenous heritage and indigenous communities? Uh, one thing I've seen over time, because I've also done a lot of work in food sovereignty, and I've attended a few of these uh, permaculture classes, and um, it's basically a fancy way of white people taking indigenous culture and farming practices and ways of taking care of the earth and packaging them in books and documentaries and calling it permaculture. And these classes are really expensive. A lot of indigenous people and people of color cannot attend them because they are expensive and they make them very expensive on purpose. And they kind of like take this knowledge and then hide it away from people of color and indigenous people so they cannot use this um, knowledge that they already have in their culture and where they live, but white people have now taken it and misappropriated it and used it in their, to make money off of it. So. That's one way. Um, also, having gone to Standing Rock in 2016 uh, with my mom and a few other people, um, I saw firsthand there where, you know, there are these pipelines being built on these reservations in the states. And it's basically them trying to pretend that they're using these pipelines to uh, basically do renewable energy or whatever they want to call it. But it's basically just them poisoning the water that the tribes and the people who live in those states are using. And they're basically poisoning them so that these communities cannot drink the water and they won't have water for their future generations. It's just like in Flint where they poisoned them. It's, it's, it's a crazy situation to 
call what they're doing development when we were already developing for thousands and thousands of years and thriving on these lands. And then they come along and used technology and all these harmful chemicals and all these harmful ways of uh, harming the earth and calling it development. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Oh my God, yes. Um, I'm gonna keep saying yes in my head for a little bit. I just needed to interrupt and say, hola, your gnats are making their way here, do something. Also, um, I love I love what everything everyone is saying. Um, it's we're here for a conversation, you know, and we're here to learn from each other. So um, I just again, I'm just thankful to be a part of this group. Um, but also going back to um, appropriation and whatnot, um, when we talk about Nubia, um, Sudan is is a multi ethnic country, and so is Egypt. Uh, um, and so when we talk about indigenous people, we're not just talking about Nubians as we understand them today, because I understand what to be Nubian, the definition may change depending on the time period we're talking about. You know what I mean? But imagine if if the word, if if the word, the popular word to use was whatever the word for a queen mother was in the Zagawa language or in the Bija language or in this language. You know what I mean? So would would we have the same reaction? So this is what I mean by when we talk about this word is just being utilized in a way because it's popular. It's the popular thing now. Um, I just wanted to throw that in there to tie in what I said earlier about um, not appreciating the culture, but just using it because it's popular at the time. I'm glad you brought that up because the connection here with um, languages and endangered languages and the re-languages of re languaging of things to frame and reframe things. Um, again, we're speaking a language like uh, Brother Nasser was asking earlier, why are we having this conversation in English? It just happens to be the conversation, it just happens to be the language um, that you know we were all colonized by at, <laughs> at some point. <laughs> Point. Um, and that's that's literally all that it is, you know. And sure, it's something that led to us being robbed of something, but that doesn't mean we can't use it as a tool to claim, reclaim what it is we are, who it is we are, to remind ourselves until we learn or relearn our language, until we learn where we come from, our history, or relearn. We use what we have. And again, it's all these, the, the languages that are, the words that are slapped, that are nice and flashy, like preservation. UNESCO, this big flashy institution with big logos and, and flags, has not learned from <laughs> its mistakes. And they're not even mistakes. I, they can't be claimed to be mistakes. Their actions, their deliberate actions, their short-sighted actions of what happened with the Nubians. And it's now, as we speak, encouraging the Tanzanian government to do the same and forcibly displace more than 80,000 Maasai people from the Ngorongoro region in the name of nature preservation. wildlife preserve you are kicking people you, there are pastoralists you are kicking them out of the, this is what they do you've tried doing it before and nature followed them where they go because of how they live what are you not learning and how are you going to call it preservation and how are you going to sit here and say they're primitive in how they live and how they be and how they are it's the language And I, and I can keep going, but <laughs> Delia? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just, uh, you know, I'm gonna bring it back to appropriation. We've, we've 
all been talking and there's some amazing points, uh, not just valid, but essential to our continuity um, as, as people of real essence um, and as people that are working um, day and night uh, to maintain uh, how we live and keep our, you know, story and heritage alive. Um, you know, it, it's it's really difficult for me to try to reel this into a, a, a small, uh, you know, comment or a side comment as in, in a panel that's, you know, an hour or two hours long. The last presentation I gave about this was in a conference and it, in it, it reeled off into a two, three hour tangent because I, I just went on screen and I just typed on Google, you know, Nubian art. And I just let, the, I, I just let the audience, they're all, you know, specialists and in, 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 in their right um, experts and educators. And they were just looking at the screen and I'm like, can just want, I just want one image that looks like me people. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to keep scrolling through. And the moment, the moment you see someone, that looks remotely like me, we start talking. And I, I think I went through five screens. And, and does that mean that Nubian has to look like me? No. Um, does that mean that people should know what Nubian looks like? Yes. Is that appreciation? Yes, I think we are a diverse people. I think we come in different sizes and shapes and features. I think and know that our history has inspired, um, you know, culture and art for thousands of years. And uh, I think that we have been able, <laughs> you're going to go there. Okay. I think that we've been able to sustain. I mean, I think things are changing since I had that lecture, by the way. So, so someone must have gone somewhere and, and reported my findings. And said, someone give her something to look at this one. She's out talking and talking and talking and rambling. Um, but I, what, what is really difficult for me to swallow and um, digest is when the brand becomes more important than the essence. And what has happened is that th this Nubia, Nubian queen, Nubian, you know, girl, Nubian man, Nubian heritage, Nubian textile, Nubian architecture. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna even go with the architecture when when I, I started even looking at the Nubian vault and uh, um, its transportation to West Africa and I mean there's a there's a whole conversation that we can have here. I, I see Minna like flinching. She she wants to go. So just hold on. Hold your horses, Minna. <laughs> don't, don't, don't. Um, there's, there's a lot that's happening. Um, and I, 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 used, I used to be very disturbed um, by cultural appropriation um, until about two years ago when I decided not to be disturbed and to start disturbing. So now I'm disturbing. I'm disturbing people that are benefiting from cultures of um, real humans with real lineage that have been able to maintain their heritage through living and living creatively and living sustainably and honoring that. I'm disturbing people that are happy to um, appropriate without appreciating. Um, and I'm going to continue to do that very calmly, very quietly, until the world at large starts to understand that the only way we're going to proceed is if we start to honor these traditions that people of... Uh, I can't say um, indigenous nature only, but, but people that have respected where they come from and respected their traditions um, are allowed to continue. We need to respect um, to be able to proceed. So I say that calmly and lovingly while I, I see you all trying to fidget. I see some fire and energy. I'm 
I'm also a, a much wiser owl. So I'll, I'll step back into the background and I'll let you pop off into the firework realm. But I just want to tell you that what I, um, what I don't respect is when people benefit financially from what cultures have held close to their hearts and, and skins and walls and textiles for years. And it hurts me to see the Pradas and the Jay-Zs and the, and the, you know, I can go on, uh, benefit from what real people have held close and kept alive for thousands of years. I'll stop there. I just want to say that people don't, like a lot of people, when they say, oh, what's the big deal, you know, if we're um, doing this or wearing this, so what? But I think what people don't get that, you know, when the Jay-Zs and the Kanye's are wearing it and then, you know, everybody else is doing it, in even within one or even two generations, people are going to forget where that even came from. They're going to think that came from Kanye. They're going to think that the Garmasis was Beyonce's designer made it and they're going to completely forget that it came from us so as much as people cry out oh cultural appropriation they're like oh calm down or calm down what they don't appreciate like you said that we've held on to this for generations upon generations upon generations and it just takes one person who, with big influence to culturally appropriate something or inappropriate it and in that one split second it no longer belongs to us. It belongs to somebody else and they forgot where it's come from. The oppressor doesn't get to tell the oppressed how to deal with their oppression. There's a comment. That's not that. Oh, I see. Why does his knees want to identify his knees? <laughs> Right, you got to ask the people who are doing that to answer that question. Well, I feel like it's 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 something that's attractive. Uh, someone is asking what the Sudanese want to identify as Nubian. Um, the issue is not with Sudanese wanting to identify as Nubian, and this is something I've been saying um, even prior to the revolution. Um, I've always said that this, the history of this land belongs to all the people who live on this land whether they are modern day Nubian or not. You know, um, 300 years ago, um, there probably wasn't a thing as Shaigi or Ja'ali or this, the, these titles that- There's a tapping guys. Is, is somebody, um, is someone not? Um, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, daddy. Dad, yeah. <laughs> sorry, no, um, these, these, these titles that we call ourselves by today, they probably did not exist a few hundred years ago. Um, Today, I fall under the banner of Hanfawi. A few generations back, I probably had an ancestor that came from Dungula or from Aswan or from the Nuba Mountains. I don't know, you know what I mean? So the people that live on this land, there have been migrations north, south, east, west, since as far back as we can, history goes. So the history of this land that we know as Sudan today and Southern Egypt included, it belongs to all the people that live on this land. The issue is people have suffered in different ways. So today, when you have a specific group of people that claims to be this thing that they have never claimed in the past and they have shunned people and poked fun at people who never stopped identifying as this thing, that's where the problem arises. It comes down to respect. It comes down to making an effort to learn. And that's what it is. So. Today, people want to identify as Nubia because they think of it of this, um, you know, magical place. This it's this this thing that existed at one point in time that no longer exists anymore. It's something of movies and from like Harry Potter world, right? I think it's from bloody Black Panther. Yeah, but it still exists. That's the problem. There's no issue with you wanting to identify as this thing, but this thing still exists. And go see the people that live there. Go talk to the people that had to watch as their homes, their mosques, their schools, their, 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 their parents and their grandparents' grave get washed under these waters of this man-made lake. 
and they were uprooted and thrown to the side in a different land, in a different um, a way of life where they could no longer speak their language, they can no longer teach it, and we are the result of, of this. Those of us here today on this live, we're the result of this. We are still attached to it because we hear the stories, but we don't speak the language. But uh, I had a gnat in my beard. I think she yanked it out. <laughs> but, uh, That's the woman for showing up. One, I really appreciate you saying that. Yeah. I don't, don't want to interrupt your point. but No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I think respect is one part of it. The mm -hmm. other part is humility. Is what, sorry? Humility. Mm -mm -mm. Humility. You need to humble yourself enough mm -hmm. to be ready to be wrong about yes. all that it is that you thought you knew. Yeah. But you, I, I could not start this initiative with Delia, the Nubia initiative, without admitting outright and saying, I do not know. I don't know enough. And this is why we're starting here. Okay, Dalia, I love you still. You don't mute that phone of yours. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, I don't know why it keeps going back. From it's them tech gremlins. It's them tech gremlins. They're feeling the power of us coming together. They just, that's all it is. But you know, we'll, we'll just, Okay, mute. so I'll mute. I'll, I'll mute, but if it unmutes, then it's not me. Okay. Okay. Mommy said your phone is culturally appropriating our chat. <laughs> That's another part of it. We need to be open to laugh. You made the point of learning. Like, uh, like I said, this is all new to me, and I will openly say I don't know if I don't know, and I will never even think to challenge anyone who's you know who studied this longer than me or you know you know you have to be open to learn but unfortunately some people care more about holding a name or being able to use something that's popular than actually learning about it and wallahi i really applaud you and say mashallah for keeping your patience because honestly if i didn't have a full day of work Mm -hmm. All we say is uh, give thanks, give thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, be being open to being wrong, being ready to be, being really ready to be really wrong. So much of what I was taught, or what I was told, or what I thought was Nubian culture, or is Nubian, it was just simply wrong. So much of what I was told was Sudanese actually traces back far beyond there was even a Sudan on the map. And again, it's not about who gets to call himself what or who gets to use what words. This whole, the efforts, the works to preserve our heritage is so that the world can continue to know and learn about our heritage from what our ancestors have built and have left by the, the problem becomes when we cannot access what our ancestors have left behind when we cannot learn what our ancestors have left behind for the world but for us as well but so when the rest of the world is going to get this information and then we can't get it it's a problem when we as indigenous people as indigenous youth start efforts to revitalize this heritage to claim this heritage to protect this heritage whatever this heritage is and i'm not just talking about nubian heritage here and then we get attacked because all of a sudden we are separatists because all of a sudden we're trying to erase this modern history, <laughs> this recent history of whatever land we end up being on. When someone comes and tells me, you're not 
African. You're Nubian, but you're Arab. I'm not Arab. Yes, at some point, I claimed to be Arab because that is what I was taught. I was taught that I was Arab. I went to schools that told me I was Arab. I grew up as an Arab Muslim girl in that order. And I say in that order because even the Islam I was taught is Arabized Islam. It's institutionalized Islam. It is an Islam where the spirit of Islam has been taken out of it to a very, very large extent. Dima, Dima, by the way, don't even respond to that uh, last comment. It's, no, it's, it's literally uh, clout chasing. I've, I've literally got more important things to respond to that. No, but like, that's, that's, that's exactly my point. That's, that's literally my point, and I'm so grateful because we'll be speaking about something and the examples will present themselves right here. I don't even need to look too far away. Claiming my heritage does not make me against your heritage. Whoever you are, whatever you are. Minna, anti dakhla fil maudua. Okay. Um, Dima, I would uh, like to continue. I have a, I have to hop off in 10 minutes because I have to, another teaching duties. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to bring this uh, forward to kind of concrete ways we see how Nubian culture, um, because this is Nubia Fest, and I'm interested also to get uh, Isa's um, input on this. This The fact that um, we see every day people making money off of our heritage and off of our backs. Uh, so we're, I'm just trying to, because we can theoretically sit here and brand people, shame people, uh, say where, where we stand, make all these, uh, you know, positions. Um, and I'm thinking from a position of, from the perspective of praxis, we, you know, we, what, what then do we do? When we are looking and seeing how, for example, uh, all these uh, architects from the north in Egypt, for example, coming in and building uh, hotels in the Nubian style, just ridiculously clownish uh, work that they just deem Nubian. And also, if you Google that on in, on Google, uh, you say if you say Nubian uh, architecture, you will see that uh, the clownish work of Egyptian and, and non-Nubian architects. Anyways, but I mean, then I go by them and I'm theorizing and maybe this I'm trying to ask you, my comrades and sisters and brothers, to solve an issue I have. Uh, so what do I do about that? So I, I know where I stand from it. They are sucking the blood out of my people. It's a bigger debate. And so people say, well, they bring business, but they take all the profit and they don't allow Nubians to, to kind of spearhead that. That business. What do you think are the initiatives or the um, the steps we can have, we can do in somehow taking back this capital, whether it's cultural or monetary, and not how or at least support uh, the reversal of these processes? What do you think? Is it? Do you think that is even possible when we see somebody just? using and appropriating, oh, let's say, not use appropriating, extracting from us, from our heritage, indigenous heritage and Nubian heritage, to, namely, which is the topic of this discussion. Do you think there's something that we can do? Uh, I don't know, moving around, competing, supporting the otherwise. I just keep thinking to myself, I can sit here for a hundred years, marking everything theoretically, but then what do we do? I definitely think um, supporting indigenous artists, supporting indigenous people who are making art and making stories and putting their culture out there and actually supporting the people who are of that culture and not supporting those who are culturally appropriating it and selling it for the highest bidder to actually support the people who are writing the stories on, you know, whatever indigenous culture it is, um, the people who are creating these beautiful pieces of jewelry to 
support people who are telling stories through music, through film, to actually support the people who are of these cultures and to make sure that the money goes to these cultures so that they can survive in these places where they are being taken advantage of by these companies and corporations who are coming in and just running amok per usual. Um, I think it's really important that we do support these people who are out here really trying to tell the stories of our cultures that go generations and generations and generations that a lot of people don't know about. But I think one of the biggest things that I've learned over time is that a lot of people are just, they just don't know about certain cultures. They just don't know anything about them. And they don't know enough because they're not enough um, in artists or storytellers are being supported from those cultures. And so I think if more were supported, like more films came out about certain cultures or more books came out or music, I think a lot more people would be willing to learn about those cultures instead of trying to culturally appropriate them. Not all, but there's a good majority, I think, who want to actually learn about these cultures and not do go the culturally appropriative route. That was so beautifully, beautifully said. And uh, I will, I, I'm literally waiting to get up this course so I can order some of your jewelry just so I can wear it. Um, uh, I 100% agree with that. And you know what, it's all to do with like using the platform that you have. So, you know, like I'm, I'm blessed at the moment. So uh, as much as I do comedy, I'm actually proposing a documentary and I'm working really, really hard with different producers and stuff just so that um, we can do like a full documentary about what Nubia is, like, you know, a documentary about Nubia exists. And that's all we can do. All we can do is use our platform exactly what you said support each other um and just by taking these kind of step 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 this is how it's going to blow up and look look this started with such a small thing and it's reached so many people and those people that it's reached they're going, going to share it and then hopefully by the like by doing that we're going to stop morons from saying certain things with a capital M. And I'm only saying that because I'm feeling brave because our army's gone because Tommy. <laughs> Iman has a very, um, first of all, yes, thank you so much. Um, some wisdom here being dropped in and some great reminders and inspiring ones at that. Um, and this is the importance of storytelling and also the importance of language. Again, we go back to language and we go back to how we communicate. And I think a huge part of the miscommunications that are happening around the world is that we are told that communication is only verbal. Communication through energy is taken completely out of the context. Nonverbal communication, our face, and what our face tells each other without saying a word, um like Ola's face makes me my laugh. face says a thousand words so <laughs> even if i'm told to be quiet i will look at you like that so no one i think you're an idiot i don't have to say it <laughs> this tells it all okay yes Thanks. but speaking of nubia and like supporting the business i think we should do a um inshallah like we should do like a whole thing about different um indigenous businesses promoting them um yours is obviously going to be first because i'm definitely going to buy your accessories because those earrings are definitely getting stolen but i definitely I tried, definitely I tried, I tried i tried i really tried i would like to let you know i have miserably failed those earrings stay with her though i do have a few mermaid earrings that she made which I, I literally cannot wait. I literally, literally cannot wait. But definitely we will do, um, that's literally just opened a complete box for us that we should do um, like a, even if it's a month of promotion of different indigenous businesses and supporting indigenous businesses. And, you know, just by circulating it, even with the, with the following and the uh, 
fan base that we have at the moment, it can already go really far. Maybe pitching it to different, um, there's lots of indigenous groups, pitching the small businesses, whatever, whatever, whatever. Embracing my Arab um, features 100%. Um, and yeah, I think that would be a really, really, really good um, idea to do. I think so. I think I, so. I, 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 I totally agree. Um, I to say, I would like to your um, phone for for a moment. It's. I want to answer Iman's question because it is important and it completely relates to what Minna was talking about. And I recognize that we are going o over time, and I uh, and Minna might need to leave us. Actually, will probably need to leave us. So I wanted to respond to that. But I want to take a moment and say, if you're on Instagram or Twitter follow or check out the Kandaka official platform. Our first month was specifically on connecting indigenous, it was indigenous food month and how indigenous heritage and indigenous cultures really gather around food and the stories that come out of food, out of, uh, out of being around food, uh, around how we, we cook how we eat how we grow our food how we know our food and how we use it as medicine how we use it to celebrate how we use it as a blessing i had a wonderful conversation yesterday with a young nubian chef who uses food as a love language to revitalize the nubian heritage and it was just fantastic and i can't wait till it's translated in english and we can add the subtitles to that so indigenous business month sounds like a great idea and it feels like a collaboration right here so we're calling it and we're putting <laughs> we're putting them out uh to the universe we'll work on that um but minna do you because this is specifically about um uh the egyptian side of nubia if you will or nubia on the egyptian side would you care to respond to um, Iman's question? Yes, this is the problem once uh, they discover there's cultural capital to extract in our area. And then our villages were now supposed to stop being places to live and settle, but as a front to uh, serve a certain imaginary. So it's a, it's a, it's an act anyways. And you find that you don't, you find that so, so many people coming in uh, seasonally, uh, opening shop, pretending to be selling, pretending to be Nubian, pretending to be selling Nubian artifacts and then leaving. I actually would not like the sh poor sh um, street vendors as much as I would slide the big corporations and the big money that comes in and rents uh, houses from people, turns it into a hotel. And then when the corona came, for example, and the, the business fell, who was there to, to bear the blunt of, of that uh, economy? Not them, the Nubian community themselves, the, whose village now became this uh, as weird open touristic. Yeah, Nubian Disneyland, exactly. And with no money coming into it, but then it's also so unsettled from its uh, place and position to serve Nubian well-being and Nubian Nubian mothering and Nubian caregiving and Nubian house and and, and homing. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that happens, and those are the lucky ones because there is at least an economic backbone. If you go to the other villages, there's there there they are dispossessed from even that kind of backbone. So even when somebody has some, when some of our people have some resources with the clean environment, the environment, the nice um, places that were produced by Nubian culture for centuries, uh, this kind of architecture is a cultural project, product, is a, it's appropriated and distorted to fit into a certain imaginary. Because uh, Iman, our role within these cultures is a role of serfdom. We should serve, serve a certain imaginary that's there to support the state-making project. It's not about our culture. It's to support the state-making project. And honestly, in this whole discussions about Egypt and Sudan, I would quote uh, um, Fred Moten when he says, I owe the nation state nothing. The nation state is there to, ser to serve me. So as a Nubians, I don't think we, um, yeah. So yeah, I'm not just going to, I'm not going to go any longer than this. But we're just gonna leave it there. <laughs>
Thank okay, you. I uh, this has been delightful. Thank you so much, Aisa, for for bringing it home. Yes, what you said. Yes, amen. <laughs> Thank you. <For> women too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And thank you so much, Ola. Your face is uh, my life. I would like to have your face there, in some <laughs> there, in because it gives me life. And thank you, my dear sister Dima. And and uh, I'll see you all during Nubia Fest. Yes. Bye. Oh, we're not going off yet. That's just Minna leaving. Yeah, that's just me. <laughs> that's just Minna leaving. We, we're still gonna close off. But Minna, thank you for joining us. Give our love to Bahar, and you know, keep doing what you're doing and keep rising, sis. Yeah, bye. Bye, Minna. Bye. For those who are following or, you know, are seeing Iman's questions, Iman is actually um, uh, in Nubia at the moment. Um, and her questions are, I'm sure, stemming from what she is seeing there. And my introduction to Iman was through Nubia Fest 2020 um, last year and the collaboration from there started as far as looking to start a Nubian like a field for Nubian studies or Nubiology or a department for Nubian studies and what that looks like and it goes into a whole feel like when I think decolonization of academia there are a few people that come to mind Iman Nadi is one of them hands down and I am really hoping that I will be able to host her um, before the end of Nubia Fest on one of the series uh, that the Nubia Initiative is holding um, by the river for these discussions. Um, so thank you, Iman, for your, uh, for your interventions, for your comments. Actually, thank you, everyone uh, who is contributing positively um, and, and holding the space for the coming together of all these, uh, <laughs> of, of, of all that we are, because really we are interconnected. We are, we, each of us has something for the other. Our creator has, has placed us in a way, has created us in a way, so, and planned this world in a way so that everyone and everything that is crossing our path has something for us. It's either a lesson, and it's ultimately a blessing or a reminder or something to shake us to our core for us to ask more questions about where we're from, about what that means, about how we claim and reclaim who we are and what we are doing to contribute to this earth. We're not, here, we're not higher or more important than trees, than rivers, than animals. But this is what we have been taught. And so I'd like us to close off this space with a message to whoever you want this message to be, to be for, to be received by, whether it's to your community or a call to other communities, whatever it is. And again, it's not yours versus theirs. And again, there's a lot of work to be done with the language and how we say things. But you all know what I mean here. <laughs> I, uh, I yield and I hold the space for you. If you have any last words to share, um, and I hope that this is just the beginning of the conversation and, and we, we, see, we see differences and we see similarities, but my ultimate hope is that we see our differences as elements of strength that we can bring together to move forward and advance and I say move forward and not develop in what's being said today. With that in mind, do you have any last words for this session? I think Aisha should go first because I think she articulates herself so well. <laughs> she, needs, she, needs, she needs to end the goodbye with a positive vibe. Okay. Well, um, I just want to say that um, as humans, as people living a human experience, but our spiritual beings, we should take into account that yes, we are all different. And yes, we all have these really rich and unique cultures and they should all be celebrated and they should all be acknowledged and they should all be 
you know, not appropriated and more appreciation for them and more learning of them from the actual people of the cultures. But we also know that we are spiritual beings. And so we all can come together to acknowledge one another and our differences and who we are as humans, because there's enough craziness out there and we should be appreciating each other and not just appropriating each other and trying to, you know, be at war with one another. Like just, we are all humans going through this experience and we should be appreciating our differences, learning from one another and uh, just more love and peace and harmony. Yeah. This is why I asked her to go first. <laughs> so you can say what she said and that's it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because she just says it so beautifully and so articulately. I might like get her to do because I do talks and stuff. I might get some lessons off you, honestly. Yeah. Might go all wrong. Um everything that she said. <laughs> and um I just hope and pray that people keep an open mind people educate themselves people if they're if they're not sure about something ask there's nothing wrong with being wrong i would say if you are like a moron or an idiot people will know that you are refrain from stupidity because it looks really bad on your end um i would say if you have any stupid comments or any stupid things that you want to say in the future that maybe once upon a time you're going to look back and think my god i was an idiot so my advice is to all those out there you know acknowledge your moronic acknowledge your stupidity acknowledge all these things because once upon a time you're going to look back and you're going to think my god why did i do that so God bless us with more brain cells. God bless us with lack of ignorance. God bless us to learn about different cultures and when not to appropriate, which should be never. And may God give us more intelligence because it really seems that some of us need a lot more than others. I mean. I agree. I agree. I, agree. I mean, I mean, I mean, I don't know what to say after that i will answer one question that's here dima are you against islam yes or oh no? don't even bother answering that he <laughs> whoever it is dima put it this way he doesn't have a profile picture oh, we don't know we don't know we don't know if it's a he or a she or a they or a polka dot whatever i don't i don't really know and i don't really care what i this is a question that <laughs> are you against islam? yes or no no someone that doesn't expose their picture and right. their name my expose picture. your name oh, no. expose no. your picture but, ask your question but 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 my profile picture on facebook is black on twitter is black and on instagram is black and i am holding it to remind <laughs> that black <laughs> is beautiful <laughs> oh that's <Yeah>. ridiculous <laughs> Jeff, Muhammad Ahmad Kamel, thank you thank you thank you for showing up and for the love iman we need this and we need these panels all of us africans all of us indigenous all of yeah. us yes 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 are you i followed you on instagram by the way i'm yeah. really excited to this. Real. you know what this connection here I, I oh this i love has blossomed I say, should worry people <laughs> the people that will be worried the most with this connection are the same people who take issue with nubia rising it is the patriarchy yeah. It is yeah. a patriarchal society. It is those who have internalized the patriarchy. And that just makes me happy. And I can't think of anything <laughs> better to close this session on. Yeah. So, we send love, peace, mm -hmm. and blessings from Nubia Fest 2021 <laughs> calendar for tomorrow. More discussions, more panels, more conversations by the Nile. Later on tonight, there might be a surprise, so do check the calendar. We might have some Nubian music live. Mm -hmm. oh, with that, oh, we send really peace, cool. love, harmony, and we say a Peace. Peace.